That was so nice, wasn't it? So I have a question for you. How many countries have you been in? Count them. I've been to the United States. How many of you have ever been to the United States of America? Okay, about a third of you. How many of you, like, you're not going to put up your hand no matter what? I see those hands. How many of you have been to Canada? How many of you have been beyond North America? I see those hands. Cool. How many of you have been um, to Europe? Let's see that. Um, how about um, South America? How many South America? Okay, a few less. How many of you have been to, uh, I'm running out of places, Africa? Anybody? I have not been to Africa. My hand can't go up. How about, how many of you have been to Russia? How many have been to Southeast Asia? Okay, yeah. How many of you have been to the Middle East? Okay, well, a lot of you have been to the Middle East, yeah. That's pretty cool. Mark Twain had this quote that he said. I just want to read it to you because I love it. He's speaking of travel. He says this. Tra Do you know who Mark Twain was? He's my cousin once removed. He lived over in Oseal Mills. <laughs> if Mark Twain was writing today, he'd write for Rolling Stone magazine. I feel sure of it. Travel is fatal to prejudice, big bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on those accounts. Wow, he just slammed them, didn't he? And then he says, broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth for all of one's lifetime. I really didn't know how true that was until I had opportunity to travel. Some of the places I've been, and I'm not saying, I've been everywhere, man. Can you play it on your guitar, Drew? Can we do that song later? I'm not doing that to you. And I'm not bragging either, but I, I've been to a number of places. I've been to several countries in South America. That was so neat. I met people on the street. I met a girl selling liquor on the street, and I think she wanted to take me home with her, but I was already married. <laughs> that was in Ecuador. I happened to have a girl walk up to me one time in the middle of the night, standing at a parade in Otavala, and I noticed she had her hands in my pockets, and she wasn't looking for hanky-panky. She was trying to take my money. The reason I knew my, her hands were in there is mine were already in there holding my money. <laughs> I have been to Europe. I've been to maybe half a dozen countries in Europe, in Italy and Austria and Switzerland, Germany. That's four. I've been to England. That counts as two because, I don't know, I'm counting it as two. I've been blessed to go to Israel two times, and I've gone to other places in the Middle East, places that if I tell you, I have to kill you. I don't want to do that, not on Christmas Eve. And I've been uh, to Red Square in Moscow. I've been to, I can't say it right, but you can't either, Olyanovsk. Anyone know where that is? It's kind of in the middle of Russia. Um, it's the birthplace of Lenin. I got to preach there. I've been to Japan as well. I've been, I've been a number of places, and I discovered something very interesting there. People are the same everywhere you go. People are the same everywhere you go. And that's why Mark Twain says that. He, he is saying, it'd be good for us to get out and see some other people. We'd find out they're just like us, and that would probably be helpful to us. When I look at people, and I've done this probably since I was in my 20s, before I was in my 20s, I wasn't, you know, I was a church kid, but I really wasn't living for Jesus at all. That's a different story. But when I, when I came to really take this baby that was born in Bethlehem seriously, I began to regard no one on any basis except for this. Where do they stand with God? That, that was like the most important question about anybody. And so I'm in Tokyo. <laughs> And I'm looking around. There are millions of people there. It's so crowded. And a thought occurs to me. How many of these people know that a baby was born in Bethlehem? And I'm in Russia. And I'm talking to a group of, of pastors there. And they're telling the, the percent of people who really, really love Jesus and are following him is so low. 
And when I walked out, I was like, how many of these people know Christ? I'm not sure. I think it was one of my grandchildren. When he found out that the people around him, he lives overseas. And when he found out that people around him and in other countries didn't even know Jesus went to the cross to die for him and them, he started to cry. Six years old. His heart was broken because they didn't know Jesus. They're just like us, though. They're, they go about their business. When you're in certain countries in the Middle East, some of which I won't tell you which, you go out at night to have a night on the town. And because there's no alcohol in Muslim countries, you drink tea and you smoke cigarettes, smoke two packs one night, just as in October, secondhand. <laughs> but I'm talking with them about their faith, about their life, and it is evident that within them, there is a desire that isn't being met. And it's evident with those in Tokyo that there is a desire, and in Russia, there is a desire that they can't figure out how, how to meet. I was talking with someone who lives there who knows Jesus, and he said, I've explained it to them, and they say, I just can't believe that. So it's not like, well, if we just tell them, they'll be dandy. They're just like us. Some of you know the story of Jesus, how he was born of a virgin and he's God in the flesh and he lived a spotless life for 33 years. And then he himself, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was sacrificed on a cross for us. And then he was seen by like 500 people after he raised from the dead. And then he ascended into heaven to the right hand of the father. A lot of you have heard that story You've, you've heard it again and again and again. But maybe you're like, like my friend's friend who's like, I've heard the story, I, I just don't know if I believe it. And by believe it, I don't mean believe it like the Steelers are going to the Super Bowl. That would take a miracle, but... <laughs> when I say believe it, I'm talking about taking it to own, taking it personally, <laughs> just for once and, and for all, just saying, there's an emptiness in me. And there's something in me that isn't the way it should be. And Jesus, if you can fix that, I'm all in. I'm all in. Remember a few moments ago, I said, that's another story. That's when I was like 20 years old, 19, 18. I was going to college. I was living the life. College was cheap then. You could repeat math as often as you needed to. And I repeated it a lot. And I can remember an emptiness inside me and sort of a... a, a dissatisfaction that manifested itself in anger. I was kind of angry about things. And I was angry at God because I knew he existed. I just didn't know what I should do with that exactly. I was dating the most beautiful girl in the world, my wife. She wasn't my wife when I was dating her. And she loved Jesus, and I wasn't sure I did. And I had just enough character inside of me, just a tiny bit, to say, I need to deal straight with this girl. I want to talk to those of you who are young and you're dating, and I just want to say you have my pity because you're in bucket seats. It's a terrible thing. We were in a bench seat. Some of you know what that means. She's sitting right on my hip here, and I have my arm around her. And we're sitting in that 77 Dodge Diplomat. And I couldn't look at her, so I looked straight ahead and I said, I gotta tell you the truth, I am not 
really sold on Jesus. That's not the way I said it. It was worse. And I thought, I really thought I was breaking up with her. I didn't want to break up with her, but I had enough character to tell her the truth. And I thought, she'll slide across that bench seat and say, take me home, Steve. But she didn't. What she did when she saw a 20-year-old, 19-year-old boy, man, boy, <laughs> hurting because of the emptiness inside of him, what this lovely lady did was just begin to weep into my shoulder, into my chest. It was wet. My shirt was wet. And I talked to God. Not out loud. He can hear your thoughts. And in the quietness of my mind, I said, I don't know about you. I mean, I know about you. I've been going to church since I was little. But if this is how you love, if this is anything like how you love, I'm in. I'm in. I want you to be mine. I will be yours. Now, let me tell you something. That young woman on a scale of one to 10, she loved at a 10. But that is nothing like God loves because he loves at a billion. And when I said those words to him in the silence of my thoughts, he said, let's go. Let's rock and roll. <laughs> my life didn't change immediately. But it began to change quickly. And over the next few months, I began following him more closely. And what I found was a sense of his presence in my life and peace in my life that has never gone away. It doesn't mean everything's hunky-dory. Do you know what hunky-dory is? Everything ain't hunky-dory. It doesn't mean that I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time, regardless of what the song says. But what it means is this little baby born in Bethlehem loved me, came for me, lived a perfect life on my behalf so I get credit for that before God, died for my sins because they needed to be cared for, and rose and sits at the right hand of the majesty on high where he intercedes on my behalf and on everyone else's behalf who turns to him the same way. It doesn't matter if you're in the Middle East or if you're in Russia or Japan. It doesn't matter if you're in Clearfield County, in Kerwinsville, or in Kerwinsville Alliance Church, or I don't know if this is anybody here, but you might be sitting in a black seat. Oh, come on, that was funnier than that. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're listening online. He came for you. And the response is, if you came for me and you love me that way, I'm all in. I want to follow you. Please forgive me. I know you can because you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I will follow you. Those words are not the best stated I have no illusion about what a great orator I am because I'm not. But those words might be the most important words you'll ever hear in your life because the message is the best message. And I would invite you in the quietness of your own heart while you're sitting beside that girl <laughs> or your mom or whoever you're sitting next to, that complete stranger, in the quietness of your own heart, have a little talk with God. God, I recognize that I'm just like everybody else, that in my heart, there's an emptiness. He has put eternity in your heart. It's hard to fathom it. And I want you to fill that. Would you do that, Jesus? 
Would you forgive my foolishness in looking other places for it because I'm looking to you now. I want to follow you. Speak to him with those kinds of words and he will change everything about your life. Everything. We're going to sing Silent Night in a minute, but I'm going to pray first and you're going to stand because I need to wake some of you up. Let's stand. Let me pray with you. Would you bow your heart? God, as we're assembled here, we're thankful for the occasion that has brought us together, the advent, the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ who came for us. We turn our hearts to him and recognize that there is no fullness, no fullness of life anywhere else except in you, Jesus. We look to you to change who we are. We look to you to save your people from their sins, to save us, to save me. We look to you to guide us and we will follow you. We are not so foolish as to think, well, we're special, we don't need that. We know this is common to man. For indeed, you are that which fills us like nothing else can. We give our hearts to you through Christ. In his name we pray, amen.